and welcome to I-24 News Defense, your weekly review of strategic affairs, security, intelligence, and more brought to you in cooperation with Israel Defense Magazine. Tonight, we'll discuss the ongoing escalation around the Gaza Strip and give you a sneak peek from uh, the upcoming CyberTech 2014 conference. But before we begin, let's take a look at what else is happening in the world. Syria. A special report depicts the systematic torture and killing of about 11,000 individuals by the Assad regime. The report was put together by a team of internationally renowned war crimes prosecutors and forensic experts and is largely based on the testimony of a Syrian government defector codenamed Cesar, a photographer in the military police, along with almost 27,000 photographs he provided. These images tell the gruesome story of torture and killing of detainees by the Syrian government. Moving just a short distance to Lebanon, a suicide bomber killed four people and injured dozens in a residential district of southern Beirut known as a stronghold of Hezbollah. Flames erupted from a building and thick smoke billowed over the street near the charred remains of cars as a crowd gathered at the site of the attack. The bombing was the third to target a center of Hezbollah supporters this year. And police killed a senior Islamist militant in a shootout in Russia's North Caucasus ahead of the Winter Olympics in Sochi. The shooting of Eldar Magatov, a suspect in numerous attacks on Russian targets, at a house where he had taken refuge in the Dagestan region, was part of an intensifying security clampdown as the games approach. Palestinian terror organizations continue to fire rockets and mortar bombs from the Gaza Strip on Israel as Israeli Air Force strikes back. How long can this fragile escalation go on? Before we try to find an answer to that, let's watch I-24 News correspondent Eli Hochenberg's report here. <laughs> Armed men and an angry mob. They hold the corpse of Ahmed Zanin, killed last night in an airstrike led by the Israeli Air Force in Bet Hanun in the northern Gaza Strip. This former member of the Islamic Jihad was in his car when he was struck by a missile. According to the IDF, this man was wanted since 2009 for his involvement in several attacks on the Gaza border and more recently in a rocket attack on the south of Israel during former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's funeral. It's a clear message sent by Israel, which seems to have renewed its targeted killing policy against members of jihadist factions. We will not hesitate to continue to act with strength in order to strike those who threaten our security, and we will do that in all the ways and with all the tools at our disposal. We see Hamas as responsible for the firing towards Israel. This very high price might come through another wide operation against the Gaza Strip, an option increasingly considered by the general staff of the IDF and for which it is getting ready. A few miles away from the Gaza Strip, this training center for urban guerrilla warfare was on high activity today. From a distance, this scenery looks more like southern Lebanon, but the Israeli soldiers know they could be heading towards something quite similar in Gaza. Training for urban guerrilla includes also the Gaza Strip. That village here prepares our tanks' crews to the situations they might encounter. For Gaza, we also have to train on more open terrains from which it is easier to reach inhabited zones, like in Lebanon, for example. On the other hand, Palestinian newspaper Al Ayam reports that, according to an Egyptian government official, Egypt has been conducting talks with Hamas to preserve the quiet in the Gaza Strip, to protect the Palestinian people and prevent Israeli aggression. According to the source, the talks mark a shift in the stance of Hamas. Whether in the form of targeted killing or a potentially larger operation in the future, it seems that rocket fire is drawing a clear Israeli reaction. Joining me now in the studio is uh, Yaakov Lapin, Jerusalem Post military correspondent. Good evening, Yaakov. Good evening. In the past months, around uh, two dozens of uh, uh, bombs has been fired on the southern cities of uh, Israel. How long can this go on before uh, it escalates to a new operation in Gaza? I think that really depends on events on the ground. Uh, Israel has sent a clear message, as the report just said, um, that it won't tolerate this drizzle of rockets that's heading into southern areas, rural district areas, and places like Ashkelon. The policy of targeted assassinations has been renewed. We've seen it twice in the past week. It's the first time in many months that this has happened. 
And all of this is really to send a signal to Hamas as the sovereign of Gaza um, that if it doesn't take the situation in hand and stop these smaller groups from attacking southern Israel, then the IDF will do the job for it. Yes, but the warning, the decisive warning that has been said to Hamas, um, maybe maybe Hamas is uh, losing its control uh, over the Strip. That is actually the assessment within the uh, IDF, that Hamas is losing its ability to control uh, smaller terrorist organizations, Islamic Jihad, we've seen the PFLP, Popular Resistance Committees. Um, but at the moment, still, Hamas is doing two things. It is uh, holding a dialogue with the smaller groups, and it has also spread and deployed its forces out in areas that are used to fire rockets. And all of this is an attempt by Hamas to softly place these terrorist organizations on notice, asking them to stop complicating the situation for us um, and, and stop firing rockets. But they haven't done anything like arrest them, which they used to do in the past. They used to arrest them, mm -hmm. find them in their homes, and, and even sometimes beat them and make them disappear for, for weeks and months on end. That hasn't happened recently. What is their interest? I mean, we are negotiating. Uh, there are the peace talks. And uh, Israel did release 26 uh, prisoners uh, out of uh, the gesture of uh, goodwill. So what is the interest to escalate everything? Well, we have several players here, and each of them have their own interest. The peace talks are going on between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Now, Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, which is run by Fatah, mm -hmm. um, is in a state of unofficial uh, animosity and even conflict with Hamas in mm -hmm. Gaza Strip. So Hamas is in, not interested in seeing these peace talks succeed in any way. However, it does have an interest in maintaining a quiet because it doesn't want the IDF to start attacking it in Gaza. Now, inside the Gaza Strip, there are smaller groups that are undermining Hamas. So we have a series of players, each uh, pursuing their own interest, and the result, that we, as we've seen, is, is fairly anarchic. Do you see an option that IDF will engage a bigger operation than 2012 uh, Pilar Defense? It all depends on what happens on the ground. If uh, we have seen in the past 24 hours a certain calming down of the situation, um, these smaller terrorist groups have seen that Israel is willing to use its precision firepower and uh, very high quality intelligence to take out the people who are firing rockets. And uh, we will. the IDF is really watching to see what will happen. It's all driven by results on the ground. If things escalate, I don't think the IDF will hesitate um, stepping up its own counterterrorism operations. A gang order that was uh, removed revealed that Al-Qaeda is uh, operating here in Israel and trying to uh, um, uh, to execute terror attacks. Are we on a bridge of a <clears throat> new terror era? Well, uh, generally speaking, Al-Qaeda and Salafi jihadis, um, they are uh, becoming more powerful in the region. In the Gaza Strip, they're becoming more powerful. There are several hundred Salafi jihadis in the Sinai Peninsula and in Syria. Um, so it does appear that this force is becoming more, better organized and more right. dangerous. At the same time, the fact that Shabak, uh, the domestic security uh, intelligence service, right. managed to disrupt these organizations shows that uh, security forces have their finger on the pulse. Yaakov Lapin, thank you so much for coming tonight. My pleasure. Sear instructors uh, at Yokota Air Base Japan prepare dozens of uh, air crew members from the U.S. Air Force each year but, uh, by testing uh, their ability to survive, evade, resist, and escape here. It's just one of those things that we hope they don't ever actually have to use. Now, there have been events where aircraft do go down. And when that happens, we want to make sure that they're ready. 139, Well, we want to make sure they know how to survive, that's for sure. Uh, we want to also make sure they understand, you know, how to interact with people. Uh, right now, if we are to have a downed event, there's a very good chance that you're going to interact with somebody, whether they're friendlies or whether they're not. Uh, challenges of the uh, of the training are definitely overcoming those aversions. So getting uh, getting comfortable with uncomfortable situations and uh, and dealing with things usually people tend to run away from, but you you have the the knowledge and the experience to know that you can actually face those. That's what we do in the initial training, and that's what we want to reinforce here: is the confidence to uh, go through the entire survival event all by yourself and come back alive. Moving on, CyberTech 2014, the international conference and exhibition for cyber solutions will be held next week in Tel Aviv. One of the leading companies in the field is the American Akamai. Iran Musli went to the Israeli offices to learn more about this relatively new field of security. 
Akamai has been accelerating the delivery of the largest digital properties on the web for 15 years now. We had to build a massive distributed platform made of a lot of servers scattered uh, and distributed across the globe on the edges of the internet. Each of these servers' goal was to provide uh, uh, the performance and uh, support the load required to serve uh, our, our customers' websites. As an example, we provide uh, uh, content delivery for the world's largest websites, Fortune 500 companies, media sites, sports sites, news sites, and so forth. But Akama also faces powerful enemies who hide behind the keyboards, trying to maliciously harm its clients. What we're seeing today are uh, both attacks that are very volumetric in nature, attacks like denial of service, where hackers are trying to knock down or bombard the web applications and stop them from actually serving contents to, uh, to clients. Uh, but we are also seeing more complex application layer attacks, attacks which try to breach the application, manipulate it, and steal customer records, credit cards information, uh, personal identifiable information, and so forth. Unlike traditional firewalls, Akamai's protection is situated on the edges of the internet. We block the attacks one hop away from the hacker, uh, and attacks never get through to the actual uh, web infrastructure of our customers. Uh, this allows us to scale and to be able to provide protections for massive scale attacks. Here you can see that Akamai gets 80 million requests and 54 million page views every second. Around 7% of these requests are identified as potential malicious activity. Security is a never-ending battle. There is a shift now uh, towards behavioral analysis where we're trying to foresee what hackers will do in the future. Uh, this will perhaps grant us the ability to close the gap between the defenders and the attackers in the future. Joining me now in the studio is Erez Kreiner, former director of uh, National Information Security Authority. Good evening. Good evening. It seems uh, 2013 was the year uh, cyber warfare became a common phrase uh, all over the world. Why is that? It really is. And it became uh, like that because cyber actually brings the war to every house, to every neighborhood, and to every uh, platform that uh, actually uh, exists on uh, Earth. Uh, you can imagine that the uh, last uh, war on American soil was about uh, 200 years uh, ago. But now, when uh, cyber hackers enter into neighborhoods, into banks, into uh, retailers, then uh, you see that the war is actually within uh, two yards, maybe one block uh, away from you. This is really something that is uh, truly new for all of us uh, here on the planet. Mm -hmm. So. All around us, we all surrounded by uh, cyber right. uh, devices. Whenever you are, doesn't matter if you are at home, you are in business, you are uh, uh, walking in the street. Even if you live in a cave, still someone can steal your identity mm -hmm. because all your identity is actually a digital one. Right. So, what are the biggest uh, threats uh, to Israel, to the Western world? Well, I would say that uh, cyber war is actually could uh, be a war of uh, those that are not uh, technology developed as the, I would say, the Western uh, countries. And uh, I would say that uh, this would be even maybe the preferness of those uh, forces uh, to attack in the West. Because Israel is a very technology technological uh, country. We yeah. are probably... Startup nation. Yeah, exactly. You know, and the vision of the prime minister and the people that uh, held the cyber issue in Israel as the National Cyber Bureau, uh, the uh, NISA, the organization that uh, I was working uh, in, the, uh, I would say there's so many companies that uh, work here in Israel, the creation, I would say, of Israeli minds and the creativity of the Israelis. Uh, and because we are, we are flexible, we move fast, we can uh, do things sometimes in uh, many ways that can't be in other nations. I think the, the Israeli ethos, yes. uh, which uh, if I s stop someone at the street here, I'm sure I can find some uh, mutual field of interest. We will find the mutual friends because he was in the army. I know somebody from uh, the right. university. Right. Uh, for, um, for international crimes, there's the Interpol. For, uh, uh, is there any cooperation between countries uh, for cyber warfare, uh, Cyberpol? 
Yeah, there is a cooperation, but it's still, I would say, just in the uh, first stage of that uh, cooperation. Because cyber by nature is very hard. You know, in, in our company, in uh, 5C, we, uh, we act uh, abroad. We, uh, we do things with uh, countries, with firms in uh, many countries. And on my former position, I used to cooperate with other agencies that uh, deal with cyber uh, issues. Right. And the problem is, Yes. Yeah. The, the problem is that it is very hard, you know, right. to come because the so law is only the beginning of a yeah, cooperation. Exactly. And as thank you so much for coming tonight. Very well. Thanks a lot. That was uh, all we have time for. Uh, be sure to catch us next week for another edition of I24 News Defense Magazine. For all the latest headlines, go log on to www.i24news.tv. Have a safe night from Jaffa Port.